Yeah, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Yes, it's Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck. By the way, are you available for dinner? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You are? Yeah, definitely. Okay, because I, I can add you. There's a few spots of it still available at the, a re uh, at the restaurant. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's great. Okay, uh, I, I'll check and let you know. Okay, yeah. good. I was wondering when you when you were arriving. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Are you sure you want to step there? Somewhere up there is better.
supposed to start? Uh, hello and good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Hood. I'm the uh, head of the Department of Computing at Imperial College London, and I therefore have the privilege of chairing the proceedings here, the uh, inaugural lecture of Professor Abhijit Ghosh. Inaugural lectures are celebrations, not just of an individual and their academic achievements, but also of uh, a department and its mission, but also larger, the institution itself. So it's a real pleasure to have him here and uh, have him speak about uh, his research. On this occasion, um, we also have a live stream, uh, an audience online. So I would like those who want to post questions online to submit that through the actual YouTube channel. And then we can uh, field some of these questions in a Q&A that will follow uh, Abhijit's lecture. Uh, before we get into the lecture, I would also like to welcome uh, Susan Eisenbach and thank her for having appointed Abhijit as head of department uh, so that he could join us in 2012. With that, thanks. Uh, I want to hand it over to Abhijit uh, to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. And it's a real pleasure to be here today del delivering my inaugural lecture pretty much 11 years exactly on the dot after arriving in London from Los Angeles uh, in cold December with a pregnant wife, a very pregnant wife. All right, so the title of this talk is computational imaging for realistic computer graphics. Uh, that's basically the kind of research area that I work on. And hopefully, uh, I'll give you a motivation of why this is necessary for realistic computer graphics. So traditionally, computer graphics developed various light transport algorithms, usually in the form of ray tracing, that simulate the bounce of light leaving a light source, like all the lights in, in this room, bouncing around in a scene, and then eventually coming onto a, a virtual camera to produce images like this. I will argue, though, that the limit of realism here was not the light transport algorithm, but actually the, the complexity of the scene description in terms of the geometry, the reflectance properties, the textures. So despite doing very complex global illumination, I would argue these images don't look that real. And instead, an image like this, with more realistic complex geometry of these glasses, sitting on a marble table, lit by the complex indoor illumination of a restaurant, although rendered by the same algorithm, looks a lot more real. So my research focuses on the task of essentially helping light transport algorithms achieve this quality of realism through imaging. And the idea is to take a photograph and essentially, through a process of measurement-based appearance modeling, get to the scene description, in this case, geometry and reflectance properties that achieve a realistic rendering result that has a photographic quality. To do this, we have to solve an inverse problem. And our philosophy is to essentially employ computational imaging techniques in the form of computational photography and or illumination to help with the solution of this inverse problem. This has many applications within computer graphics, obviously starting from the entertainment industry where a lot of the original research was done to more modern applications in advertising and product design. Almost anything you watch on TV or in the movies these days is computer generated imagery. Architectural visualization, my wife is an architect and she's basically rendering with GPUs all, all day long. Uh, and modern a AR and VR applications are increasingly gonna go get more and more realistic. So these are the traditional computer graphics applications of this work. But hopefully in today's talk, I will motivate some other applications outside of computer graphics that also exploit this kind of research. So the way I see realistic computer graphics is it has three stages, at least for my research. We start with a measurement stage, and we develop various measurement protocols and apparatus and setups to essentially acquire the scene descriptions, geometry or appearance. And then we usually fit that measurement to a model, which could be a mathematical model or physics-based model or more recently even neural models. And when we do this, we have to go from measurement to modeling, we have to solve an inverse problem. Once we've done this, we can then drive the forward problem of rendering to hopefully produce photorealistic images on the output. 
So this kind of research is quite cross-disciplinary, and essentially we work at the intersection of computer graphics, imaging, a lot of applied optics, and you might learn a little bit more applied optics than you care for today, but that goes with the, with the turf. And of course, now modern deep learning and neural modeling and rendering techniques, which are a new tool in the toolbox that we work with. All right, so before I get into the details, I definitely have some important people to thank, and this leadership in the department, uh, Susan, of course, hired me, but other HODs, Daniel and, and Michael, and of course, Anne, nothing happens in the department without Anne behind the scenes. Uh, they're fundamental in, in, in the progression of my career in terms of support with lab spaces, uh, which are critical for uh, experimental work, the kind of stuff that I do. I also want to thank Andy Davison for the mentor mentorship he's provided as a senior academic in visual computing. And of course, Stephanie Seferi, my closest collaborator within the department, who's advised not just on, on, on the research, but also on technology commercialization. So thanks on that. Uh, of course, the most important people to thank are members of my realistic graphics and imaging group, my students and postdocs, some of which are listed here who have now gone on to these places. Uh, and on the left, you see essentially a word cloud of the names of the papers we've published. These are just the titles of the papers. And some of the words that you can see there are typically not very computing, perhaps. But hopefully, I'll uh, motivate that uh, computing can also be doing these sort of things. So we have a full agenda. So let's get to it. I'm going to talk about our work on high quality appearance capture of material samples that span both geometric optics and some wave optics. So this word optics is going to keep appearing again and again, so bear with me on that. I'm going to talk about high quality facial capture and biophysical modeling of skin appearance and skin rendering simulation. I'm going to talk about completely different types of objects like transparent and translucent objects where, and the image formation model required to actually reconstruct these. And the very end, I'm going to talk about some inverse problems we are also looking at in collaboration with UKAEA on plasma physics, essentially diagnostic imaging of fusion happening in, in a plasma tokamak. All right, so first let's talk about surface reflectometry, which is the process of measuring the surface reflectance of any material, which usually requires you to build apparatus like this where you control the light source from every specific direction and photograph the material reflectance from it, any of the desired directions over a hemisphere of directions. But fundamentally in computer graphics, we usually simplify that to essentially extract parameters of a reflectance model where we really are essentially caring about how bright or dark the reflectance is in both the diffuse, which is the body color, and the shine, which is the specular reflection. And the other one that we care about is roughness, how dull or sharp the shine is. So these are the parameters we care about Usually, you will take a dense measurement and fit it to a model that explains that these high-level aspects. So instead of doing dense measurements, with my first PhD student at Imperial, Jeremy Rivera, in collaboration with Peter Pierce, who's my long-term collaborator at the College of William and Mary, we thought, let's take a mobile device, and it has a flash and a camera next to it, and can we do just some handheld measurements like this and acquire the surface reflectance properties? When you do this, what you're doing is you're sampling the, only the backscattering directions, in, in, unlike a proper gantry where you have all the possible combinations. It turns out, when just doing this, you still have sufficient information for every surface point to extract what is called a reflectance trace, which encodes both a body diffuse reflection and a specular shine, which means now you can run an optimization process and actually fit all of the parameters of the microfacet BRDF model or the typical reflectance model, your favorite model that you want to drive this rendering with, which means you have your per parameters of simpler functions that you fit to the trace, and now you can drive a realistic rendering, which hopefully then produces a very photographic appearance when you do the, the, the rendering results. So this is what you can do when you are indoors and you can control the illumination with your device, which is a, a, in this case a flash on a phone or a mobile device. What if you're outside? So in a follow-up project with Jeremy, in collaboration with my postdoc at the time, Ilya Rishtuski, we started looking at a computational photography technique. Common photography uses things like a polarizer, usually it is to kill a shine, 
But in our case, we essentially put a polarizer in front of a camera and rotate it in multiple or orientations to extract the information that would normally be required uh, to be extracted for surface reflectometry. So what is polarization? Polarization is actually a waveform of light source. Now you have to consider light as a waveform, and it's really the orientation of the electric field of that wavefront. Normal light is unpolarized, which means the electric field is randomly oriented. We can think of it as mathematically two orthogonal states, perpendicular and parallel. But when they go through a polarizer, like here, only one of those orientations survive, which is aligned with the polarizer. Now, normally, this would happen if it goes through a polarizer, but it can also happen when light reflects off a surface. Specifically, at the Brewster angle, even though incoming light is unpolarized, after reflectance, only one of those components reflects. The other one transmits inside the material if it's a dielectric. By, by that, I mean it's a met, non-metal. It's, it's a re regular material that's not a me metallic material. When this happens, the reflected light is strongly polarized, and we can exploit that property to do surface reflectometry. So now if you actually go outdoors in an open environment and you observe a surface, in this case, this drain cover outside Queen, our building, uh, Huxley building on Queensgate, uh, in three different orientations of the polarizer, you will notice that the surface reflectance is changing on the surface. And in fact, the intensity changes along a sinusoid. Three observations along the sinusoid allows you to fit the sinusoid and essentially predict the minima and the maxima. We need to do this from two different viewpoints because then that uniquely determines the surface normal of the surface point. Once we've done this, the minima gives us both the diffuse reflectance, so absence of shine, and the surface normal. And then the maxima gives us this, all the information we need about the shine, which is the specular reflectance. So unlike previously, when we had to optimize for all the parameters, now we only need to optimize for one parameter, which is the specular roughness. That means we've analytically determined as many of the parameters as possible, reducing the, the effort of optimization. To do this, we need to measure the incident illumination. We can do that by measuring a light probe in the scene. And now we've resolved surface reflectometry of the surface outdoors in an uncontrolled environment. We can do this from drain covers. We can also do this for stone and brick surfaces. And in my case, we also brought some items from my home, particularly this one, which happens to be the, my wedding album, which much to my wife's annoyance, I've never actually opened and seen any of the pictures. I'm much more obsessed with the surface cover and its bumpiness and its shininess. That's what you get. So more recently, with PhD student Emily Nog, uh, we have extended this technique to uh, once again bring the reflectometry back indoors, replace the environmental illumination with an iPad, so a controlled illumination source. What it does allow us is to further reuse me measurements to a single view, and now we are almost optimal because we just require five measurements to directly extract five parameters. Uh, there are two parameters encoded in the normal map. So that's why the five is to five ratio. In that case, we do not need to do any optimization. It's direct information of all of these channels. If you were to use instead a more modern polarization sensing camera, where essentially the camera sensor already has polarization filters at the bare level, that means you can further reduce this to just two photographs. So this is now where we squeezing the number of measurements to less and less and extracting more and more out of it. Since I judge a book by its cover, here are some more book covers and their reflectometry. And here's a qualitative comparison of photographs on the left and renderings on the right to give you an idea of how well we can do this. So hopefully I've convinced you that we've done the surface reflectometry well. So can you do any better? Can you reduce measurements further? And the answer is yes. And the solution is deep learning. And this is not my work. This is the work of Valentin de Chantry when he was doing his PhD at INRIA, where he published the seminal SIGGRAPH paper where he showed that just flash illumination, one photograph of an unknown sample, if you pipe it through a deep neural network, you can do very good reflectometry in, in that sense uh, and predict all of the maps that are required to do realistic rendering. So I had the pleasure of hosting Valentin in my group as a postdoc after he finished his PhD, after I was his examiner. No conflict of interest. Uh, but essentially, the idea was 
if we combine computational imaging with deep learning, then it should hopefully do better than just deep learning on regular photographs. And that's what we pushed in this project where Valentin uh, collaborated with my PhD student, Yiming Lin, in the CDPR paper where we are piping not just a flash illumination photograph, but multiple polarization images of that object under flash illumination from which we also then extract additional information of object color and object surface orientation. Uh, these are not complete information. They are, they are essentially, you could say, ambiguous information of shape, but they're still strong cues to a deep neural network where basically now it produces very high quality uh, appearance and shape maps under just flash illumination image. Uh, now, computer graphics plays another role here where we use graphics to produce synthetic training images because there isn't enough real images to be able to do the sort of deep learning with real data. So synthetic data also required us to simulate polarization images in a rendering and to produce enough data for training. But once you've done that, we showed in this work that the Computational imaging plus deep learning produces much more accurate shape and reflectance information for these objects. The same network architecture when trained on just flash illumination produces inferior results for the same computation and the same uh, training data. All right, so up to now I've covered a whole bunch of samples, but all of the surface reflectance properties exhibited qualify under what is called geometric optics. With PhD student Antoine Toisson, we looked at some objects that are much more complex, but very common these days, including your phone screens. Oops, I shouldn't drop that. That exhibit strong surface diffraction effects, which is what we looked at in this project. So what is surface diffraction? It is really the iridescence that you observe on surfaces due to a microscopic diffraction grating, which is periodic in its nature, and many manufactured materials have this, which causes essentially wave interference causing spectral uh, patterns to emerge on these objects. And physics simulation of this is very complex and would take too long to produce real imagery like this. So what we did was we first came up with a simplified diffraction reflectance model, which is based on a Fourier transform of the underlying height field, the diffraction grading. And then we made one more twist, which is you don't need to compute this Fourier transform, you can photograph it. Using the Huygens-Fresnel principle, we do an optical Fourier transform by actually illuminating the sample with a beam light, in this case, just a flash illumination. And what emerges on the sample, assuming it's large enough for you to see it, directly is the diffraction pattern, which means now we can just record it and drive our rendering model. There's one caveat, this is a spectral model. So the first thing we have to do is actually apply a spectral filter and reduce the measurement to one specific individual wavelength, not the entire visible spectrum. Then we can computationally offline extract the rendering required under RGB spectrum by essentially integrating the spectral measurement under the spectral sensitivity of your desired camera. So that's doable. Once you do this, you can generate hopefully quite realistic complex diffraction patterns of different types of materials from holographic paper to LCD screens. This has one limitation though, it needs a homogeneous sample large enough for you to see the actual diffraction pattern. There are many manufactured materials that exhibit diffraction that are designed to produce very cool patterns which are essentially printed holographic samples where you can't directly observe the entire diffraction pattern. So to solve the inverse problem of this, uh, Antoine and my postdoc at the time, Daljit Dillon, they collaborated on this problem. And to do this, we need help. So the first help we do is we assume an underlying image formation model. So the holographic printing process is quite cheap and simple. You essentially have a dot matrix printing process that deposits essentially sinusoidal 1D gratings at different orientations and with different periodicities in different parts of a paper sample, and there's a plastic cover which creates other problems, but let's forget about that. This is essentially what we now need to recover if you want to render such a sample. The orientation and the phase of these essentially printed sinusoidal grating structures. So to do this, we again look at polarization imaging, but in this case, in a novel way, we want to exploit the wave optics aspect of polarization to reason about a wave optics effect, in this case, 
the anisotropy of the diffraction grating itself. And on this kinematic pattern, which is a very smooth pattern, if you touch it, it's, there is no anisotropy, physically speaking. If you rotate a polarizer now under polarized light while you observe such a pattern, again, you will notice that the polarizer reacts to this underlying uh, material. What's happening is that the polarization is reacting to the, the local orientation of the grating structure, which means we can co now computationally reason about actual orientation grating and relative phase of such a sample. So of course, we were cheeky and we tried to extend this to, hey, can we do uh, diffraction grating analysis of the security hologram on a 10 pound banknote? We actually had to send our SIGGRAPH paper to the Bank of England for their perusal to see how much of their manufacturing process we were revealing in our SIGGRAPH paper. Uh, after about a month, I think they got back to us and said, okay, we are allowed to publish the paper, which means we were unsuccessful in <laughs> revealing the, the manufacturing process of a security hologram, good for Bank of England, and maybe not so good for us. But essentially, thank God, uh, security holograms are not as simple as sinusoidal gratings. But uh, at least for computer graphics applications, we can produce very cool looking imagery, I think, with this process but it has implications in analysis of fabrication and inverse analysis of material defect inspection, perhaps. So the, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is now we are starting to go beyond the standard computer graphics to look at inverse analysis of, of things out there. All right, hopefully I've warmed you up. And now we're switching topics from materials to human faces. And so the state of the art for capturing human faces, which is now the industry standard and used by many Hollywood movies, is the light stage. And I happened to work on the development of the light stage previously at the University of Southern California. And ended up building one uh, here at Imperial with my PhD student at the time, Christos Kamporis. Uh, what we did is we built a multispectral light stage with many different lights with different spectra. And I'll hopefully uh, motivate why we did that. Uh, and so with this setup, uh, with nine cameras, uh, with another PhD student, Alexandros Latas, we also did high quality multi-view facial capture with this uh, and, and built a database uh, of, of, of faces that, uh, that we acquired for various applications. But this is about the time that uh, we spun out uh, a startup company from Imperial called Lumerhythmic, and the idea was to make facial capture much simpler than having to require complex apparatus like the light stage. A light stage can't go to many places. It's, it's a very expensive and difficult device to operate and maintain. So our first product that we built at Lumerhythmic is this desktop capture product, where essentially just within the form factor of our typical desk, we have a set of screens, in this case iPads, illuminating a subject, and in a two-shot method with two spe specific lighting conditions, we can digitize the face to hopefully this level where we can now do hopefully high quality realistic rendering of, of the face. Uh, and so we do not now need the complexity of a light stage. So what I showed was the two lighting conditions which are these uh, falling on a face. And these enable us to reason about both the reflectance albedo and the surface shape the surface normal, and split the reflectance into its diffuse and specular components using a color space analysis instead of a polarization analysis. And produce renderings of this fidelity where we can see fine scale pores and, and wrinkles and other things that you might observe only when you go really close to someone's face. So at Lumerhythmic, we've taken this to the next stage where now, after capturing enough faces with such a device, we can now power just a single handheld phone scan with the power of deep learning to essentially produce the same quality of result with just a handheld phone scanning someone's face. So this is an iPhone scan of Jay and our team uh, done very recently, actually. Uh, and this is the quality that we can now produce with mobile devices. All right, so this should satisfy most computer graphics applications of realistic rendering, building your favorite avatar uh, in your homes. 
but uh, we are also interested in examining human skin reflectance a bit more uh, at the biophysical level. So we've done another body of research that examines human skin reflectance. Uh, and this work was, we started with PhD student Yulia Gitlina in collaboration with longtime collaborator Claudio Guadnera, who's currently at the University of York, and Baljit, who, as I mentioned, was a postdoc in our group at the time. So what we are trying to do is study why does skin color look like the way it does? And it does that because there are layers in human skin, epidermis, which has melanin, and deep epidermis, which has hemoglobin. And these are spectral chromophores, and they have spectral absorption and scattering characteristics, which means whatever color you see on the subject's face is the result of whatever absorption and scattering happens here. To reason about this, we st first worked with the light stage. I mentioned multispectral LEDs on our light stage, which have different spectral characteristics. We illuminate a subject's face with broadband illumination specially designed for this purpose, D65, which is broad daylight spectrum, and then a blue illumination, which is a narrow band illumination that is spe specifically designed to excite melanin in the epidermis. With this, we can then reason about different parameters of melanin concentration over the face and hemoglobin concentration, which can then drive a biophysical skin simulation model to simulate essentially spectral rendering and spect spectral reflectance of skin under any desired arbitrary spectral lighting condition. So this is broad daylight spectrum, and these are the three LED white light spectrums that we have on the light stage. And we can also simulate narrow band RGB illumination and how skin changes its appearance under these different spectral illumination conditions. You will notice that all of the skin texture completely disappears under red light, where it is strongly visible under green light. And this is only possible when you have a spectral rendering mechanism, not an RGB rendering anymore. So this, in this paper, we were driving mostly spectral rendering process but it's possible to go even further. So in a more recent work with PhD student Shaori Lee, we first collapsed the light stage to just the screens, as I talked about before, which produce RGB illumination. We've expanded the skin reflectance model to now from visible spectrum to hyperspectral, which means it's spanning into the UV spectrum on the short wavelength side and the infrared spectrum on the long wavelength side. And we've also expanded the dimensionality of the biophysical model, which means now not only can we reconstruct facial appearance under white light, we can also predict facial appearance under UV light and infrared light. Just to tell you how close we get, here's a photograph comparison to a UV photograph that we are predicting measurement under white, uh, visible light, but prediction under invisible light, in this case UV and IR, to tell you how, how, how good we can get with this sort of prediction. So this has applications beyond computer graphics, definitely in dermatology, in skin care, and, and that sort of domain. Uh, we're starting to really get close to the accuracy required for those domains. Now once you have a biophysical skin model and its appearance parameters, you can do biophysical edits, like if you do melanin edits, you can simulate lightening or tanning of skin. If you do hemoglobin edits, you can do flushed or pale appearance of skin. And if you do beta carotene edits, you can make more olive or yellow skin tones. And in even more recent work, just recently submitted to CVPR, we are exploiting again RGB illumination, but this time trying to reason about other biophysical characteristics on the skin, particularly elastin inside the skin or blood distributions in the veins and, uh, and, and arteries underneath the skin. And so this is, again, a project led by PhD student Emily Nog. Uh, so what is fluorescence? Fluorescence is when a material absorbs light at a short wavelength and then releases energy at a longer wavelength. So there is a wavelength shift in the re reflectance. So it's not reflecting the exactly the same wavelength. And this just happens uh, through absorption at high energy and release at lower energy state. Now in human skin, there is elastin, which is naturally there to help with the stretchability, which we can actually detect because with our illumination, we are literally exciting the, the tails of elastin excitation and then measuring in the green channel of the camera the tails of the elastin re-emission, which tells us we're getting a noisy signal because of the me measurement not being that strong, but still we are getting strong signals of 
elastin being high, uh, high concentration in the lips, nose, and the ears, which are the more elastic parts of the face. So this obviously has applications in diagnostics of skin elasticity and health. And strong measurements of blood distributions. Again, in this case, we're not relating the measurement to a biophysical model, but directly doing mathematical operations of the crosstalk of illumination and color channels within the camera. So this is blood in the, in essentially the capillaries underneath the skin and the concentrations and oxygenation here. So veins carry deoxygenated blood and the capillaries carry oxygenated blood and that's essentially what we are visualizing here. So this definitely has applications beyond computer graphics in health monitoring. So this is the kind of applications that we are now able to get to beyond the traditional computer graphics. All right, so now I've talked enough about skin. I'd like to move on to the topic of transparent objects that are really everyday objects that we have, and how can we reason about digitizing these sort of things. So the first project that we looked at was with PhD student Jaiwan Kim in collaboration with postdoc Ilya Rishatuski. Axial symmetry is quite common in many of these objects. They are designed to be held uh, in hand with axial symmetry. So this simplifies the image formation model. We can do single view imaging. And now because these transparent objects are mostly transmissive, we have to switch from reflective imaging to transmission imaging. So what we do is we put a screen behind the object, a camera in the front, and now by projecting high frequency stripe patterns on the screen, we are essentially trying to reason about how does light travel from the screen deflect through the object and arrive at the camera, which means what is the refractive index of this object that caused this deflection? What is the curvature on the surface that causes the rays to bend? And once we have this measurement, we can then do an inverse rendering simulation, so an optimization where we are essentially guessing the shape, doing forward ray tracing, checking the virtual bending of light with the real bending of light, feeding back the error and, and iterating to optimize the, the, the shape of the object. Once this converges, hopefully you can see that the renderings of the virtual objects on the top row are a close match to the photographs of the actual objects in the bottom row, which tells you we did a, hopefully a pretty good job of digitizing this object. We can also do this with ob glass objects containing liquids in them, where basically uh, you have two types of liquids, one which are clear, which only do absorption, and others that are cloudy that do both absorption and scattering. And even then, there is enough information in the, in the single view imaging for you to do the inverse estimation of all of the parameters to produce renderings on the right that are hopefully a good match to photographs on the left. So single view imaging is great, except when things get more complicated, when you have arbitrary objects that have arbitrary shape, arbitrary reflectance properties, and labels that block transmission, then you cannot do that anymore. So now we have to go to multi-view imaging of general arbitrary translucent objects. And we do two sorts of imaging. This is project led by PhD student Arvind Lin. So we do first reflection measurement by illuminating the sub uh, object with screen illumination from the front, in this case sinusoidal illumination. It gives us diffuse and specular reflectance and surface normal information. And then we repeat the process with backlighting and then extract transmission albedo and transmission vector, just like the deflection map, transmission vector is essentially the same thing. But we repeat this process from multiple viewpoints, so all of these views have their own maps. You will notice that there are gaps in the screen, so there are gaps in our reflectance, so they are not very nice maps. But now if you do a volumetric reasoning with all of these maps using essentially a volumetric neural rendering process, then what happens for us is that the volumetric reasoning, A, cleans up the maps, produces a higher quality maps, but then it also predicts these maps from any desired viewpoint over the volume that you've captured it from. And then you can then essentially multiply the maps with the illumination to produce the rendering. The surface normals are also a very good source of information to predict very high quality geometry. So here is a rendering of this liquor bottle uh, visualized from novel views under novel lighting environments, and no, normal neural rendering with NERFs, which are very popular these days, cannot achieve these effects, because now we are doing view-dependent reflectance, caustics, scattering, transmission, reflections, everything. 
which would not be possible uh, otherwise. Uh, here are some two other objects with different scattering properties and complex geometry that we can solve with this kind of a combination of computational illumination with a vol neural volumetric reasoning. All right. So the last thing I want to cover is another inverse problem we are currently looking at, which is diagnostic imaging of plasma, which happens inside a tokamak chamber. So this is a collaboration with Stan Pamela from UKAEA and Peter Pierce, and the project is led by PhD student Ekin Osterk. Now this kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration is only possible when serendipitously many things happen. Firstly, Peter, Peter Pierce's wife, Saskia Mordech, is actually a plasma physicist who comes to UK year quite often, and she made the connection. Secondly, Ekin applied with the CV saying, I am, have a physics degree, I would like to do computing, and I've just done plasma physics at a European space agency, and I'm like, oh wow, this is the perfect fit for this project. There is hardly any student that has the background that can do this kind of things. So what we're trying to do is when a plasma gets created inside a tokamak chamber, it creates this purple kind of flame. Essentially, it's an emission from the surface of the plasma. It has usually, it's a deuterium atom emission, which usually has these bands at which it emits, but most of it, I'm told, is confined to the D-alpha line, which is this red spectrum. Secondly, there is something called toroidal symmetry, just like we had with the glasses axial symmetry with plasmas. Usually, you create them in a donut shape inside a tokamak with magnetic field confining the plasma, which means one photograph has all the information because all views are the same views, essentially, because of this symmetry. So now you have this one view, and what you want to do is predict the states of, essentially, the physical states of the plasma that cause this emission to happen. So the first thing we do is we put a D-alpha line filter on the camera, and this is done uh, at uh, MAST. This was, that was an image of MAST. Uh, and essentially, what we want to do is predict the electron density, the neutral density, and the temperature density. The neutrals are the hardest ones because they, by nature, they cannot be measured by any other sensors. There is some measurement of electron and temperature density that are sparse, what we want to do is do dense prediction of an entire 2D profile. And we care about 2D profile because of the symmetry. 2D profile is as good as 3D in this case. And the idea is from that image predict this such that it explains an emission profile that hopefully closes, closely matches the actual photographed plasma. So this is a highly ill-conditioned uh, problem, and our solution to solve this is to look at deep learning techniques. So the quest, first question is, how do we do this? Uh, we need synthetic data. There is just not enough simulation data to do this without producing synthetic data. And simulations are too slow, too complex, too slow to produce enough data. So stands come up with an approximate parametric model, which we sample relatively randomly to produce states, some of which are physically based, others could just be configurations of the parametric model. And then there is the issue of doing realistic rendering of that synthetic data to produce an image that hopefully looks like a photograph. So there are things like null scattering of optically thin emissive volume that we are looking at. We are doing differentiable rendering to essentially optimize the CAD file that we've been given of the plasma chamber to essentially optimize the wall reflectance parameters, essentially, and also do domain translation to make our rendered images look like photographs of a machine vision camera with specific characteristics. So this is a hard problem. We've been working on it for a couple of years now. Uh, we hope to submit our paper soon to nuclear fusion, but this is the kind of cross-disciplinary work that uh, can happen. And the way I see it, this is more and more the future of this kind of work, where basically, future computer graphics research could be essentially generalizing beyond just cameras and beyond the visible spectrum. We could be thinking not of image formation models, but signal formation models. We could be looking at multimodal imaging that combines sonar, radar, uh, what have you, what, uh, all the different kinds of sensors, 
which means that the idea of generating synthetic data is no longer about just rendering it, but simulating a phenomena. It need not be optical. It could be outside the optical spectrum. And of course, I think deep learning and differentiable rendering are going to play an increasing role to solve these kind of inverse problems, either by providing fast approximations or priors for ill-conditioned problems. So I'm not an expert on any of those topics, but these are the kind of challenges and the opportunities that, we, that I see uh, for, for the future of this sort of research beyond computer graphics. So before I end, I definitely would like to acknowledge uh, the various funding sources that have supported this, this body of research. And I think, I don't know about you, but I think we are looking forward to some drinks, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Abhijit. This was a fascinating talk and it gave us such a, you know, a perspective on computer graphics and its future. It's really exciting. So, so thanks, thanks again. Uh, I think we have some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, I think, uh, yes? Uh, we don't, questions don't, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so maybe any questions in the audience? Um, there's one over there. Thank you. But wait, just wait for the microphone to come to you. Thanks. With the skin elasticity, the collagen, uh, do you discover interesting things if you point it at somebody who's elderly or has got severe burn injuries? So two things. Uh, we actually do not... I'm still on the mic. Are you audible? Uh, so we don't measure collagen. We me measure elastin. I believe collagen's excitation spectrum is outside the visible range. It's in the UV spectrum, and we are explicitly not using UV light. Uh, but even had we done that, uh, this is in its infancy. We haven't gotten quite to the point where we can look at people with injuries. Uh, that's, that this would require us, and is obviously the future, for us to actually collaborate with a medical uh, professional and expert on, on that side of things. Uh, in my lab, we try to do things as practically as possible, not irradiate people with UV light, <laughs> just natural LCD screens, which people are anyway getting irradiated by all day long, <laughs> and see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, further questions? This one over there. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, very impressive and very beautiful also to, to, to look uh, at uh, the results. Um, in the case of uh, faces, you used some information about uh, the structure of the face in order to, uh, to make the rendering better. Uh, are there other applications where you are using uh, such uh, information? Uh, Deeper so by, structural. By, by that, do you mean the biophysical nature of human skin? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, so in this case, uh, yes, yeah, so there are two places I, I gave. One example was the, the biophysical structure of skin that we, we knew about from tissue optics literature. And the other application was the measurement of uh, the manufactured holographic paper, right? So there is literature on dot matrix printing process. And, and because we know that Im, uh, the image formation model there, uh, based on fabrication techniques, we, that helps with the, with the underlying inverse problem. If you know nothing about the underlying image formation model and have to figure everything out, that's a significantly harder problem to solve. So we are always working with priors wherever possible, where either the structure is known from literature, uh, whether it's biological or, or, or physical, uh, uh, and, and, and then try to reason about some parameters. Uh. So are there other such applications, perhaps not developed by you, where they are using the information about the underlying structure of what is uh, being rendered? For instance, textiles. Oh yeah, absolutely. So fa fabrics uh, are definitely an example where people study, and there are some experts of that in the room actually, uh, so the, 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 the threading, uh, and, and, and the essentially, uh, I, I don't know the terms, so maybe you can answer that. The weaving, 
uh, and, and essentially uh, satin versus silk versus uh, cotton have different characteristics of, of surface reflection, tensile strength, all of that. Andy was probably next right there, up there. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Um, in, in the work where you were reconstructing the transparent objects, how do you actually represent the shape of those objects so you can optimize it? Very good question. So I think that this we left to Jaiwan to decide. I believe what he decided was he was going to go with essentially circular cross-sections. Um, it doesn't have to be circular, but ba basically solve it layer by layer, and essentially he, he would just triangulate across the layers. That may not be the most efficient geometric representation of it, uh, and Niloy can advise us on better geometric representations, but that's how he decided to solve it. Thanks. Um, I think there was one there. So each scan line was a, was a layer that he was solving for. Uh, so for the light, for the light dome and the other examples, from my understanding is that there's one illumination and one capture. I'm wondering if people or yourself you have uh, explored the idea of creating a feedback loop where the illumination guides the capture and then the capture guides the illumination again to optimize the whole pipeline. I believe there have been some works of that type. Uh, especially when not necessarily uh, capturing simple objects like these, but higher dimensional light transport capture. There have been feedback loops uh, used, uh, basically mm, several levels of wavelet illumination, feeding back to see which coefficients are dominant and then going further down the tree of those, those wavelet coefficients, and something like that, yes. Okay, I think there's a question there. Thank you, what a great talk. Um, does the, do the techniques that you've described here that work very well for skin and faces, do you think they would port to biological organs, like the brain or the liver? Absolutely, so in fact, with Dan Elson sitting right next to you, uh, we've already discussed uh, the uh, aspect of trying to essentially scale the skin, multispectral imaging, work that we are doing to brain tissue, because uh, in surgical imaging, there is multispectral imaging done f of that sort of tissue, and there is l literature of tissue optics. So this is kind of where I, in my last, last slide, I said that there is, there is whatever we're doing for skin tissue optics should generalize to other tissue optics. The measurement modality in a surgical situation is obviously much more challenging, uh, but at least on the simulation side of it, to even produce data for deep learning, that sort of work can be done. Um, any further questions? This one there. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask if, in like dermatology, in a way you can like see what each, like, um, what the pores and everything. Is there a way you could accurately change the lighting so that you could see what a person's face would look like um, in any other, like what their skin could look like in the future? Or like accurately predict if they're like when an acne clears or something, if it could um, change the lighting or change the um, skin so that you could see what a person's clear skin would look like under different pores or something like that of the sort. Can we go back to slides maybe? Oh, this is uh, maybe more closer to the end, but anyways, I, I think I did show some biophysical simulation uh, of skin that we can do. Uh, to, uh, when you say later, do you mean much later, like aging? Because uh, th that requires not just skin optic simulation, but skin geometry simulation. But there, there is some work uh, and some work that we are ourselves doing uh, that, that isn't going in that direction. Yes. Yeah, um, so it was like, if you, could you actu accurately predict what a person could look like in the future as well? So like 50 years into the future, if we could predict some, where someone's wrinkles would, could go? I believe there are many people doing that sort of research, but that's more of a deep neural network prediction over large data uh, rather than maybe an optics simulation like this that I, I'm showing here. Thanks. Um, question over there. Thank you. 
Thanks, this was fascinating. Um, I, I'm wondering, you, you showed different projects over time to fit as well as possible skin uh, using visible light with models that generalize outside of the visible light, right? And you've progressively added more. Are there properties you think are still needed to accurately represent skin, or do you think that you're at a point where it's visually indistinguishable? What's your... It's a good question and a hard question to uh, explicitly answer. I would say our current latest paper probably achieves as much fidelity as most computer graphics applications would care for. There's, at this point, any, adding any further complexities and perhaps more motivated by non-graphics applications rather than with graphics applications. We do have a question online. Uh, so. Um, oh. Uh, so someone is asking if you have looked at recovering subsurface scattering from faces via inverse Monte Carlo path tracing. <laughs> uh, that is the other way of doing it, uh, which is the more computationally expensive. Uh, what we do is we instead rely on a biophysical model and then tabulate various parameters of that spectral model and its conversion to RGB values that we can measure with our measurements. Uh, full path tracing simulations are, have been done by other, other people, other, other uh, groups. Uh, there's work from Chen et al. And, and also a group work from uh, Meta that has gone that, that direction. We've tried to not do that just to simplify the in, inversion process. Thanks. Maybe one last question uh, from the audience. Yeah, please. Just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, thanks. Just a quick question. Um, an amazing talk and a lot of insight to all of us. As we know that US and China are much progressive than us, would you say that they must have already done something like this in before us? Uh, I know that Imperial College does a lot of research, and we do have a lot of lovely insights and a lot of learning from ourselves for the whole of UK and for our brightest students coming up for the future. But uh, what would you be thinking that have US or China already beaten us or have they already done some kind of research? Well, so uh, we publish our work internationally and we follow international literature. So when we submit papers to conferences, uh, they're reviewed by international uh, re researchers, so uh, hopefully we are aware of all of the work that's out there, including in the US and in China, as you mentioned. Uh, and so hopefully this is world-class work we're doing at Imperial College. <laughs> Thanks, I think that's a, a good uh, uh, place for stopping the Q&A. And it's my pleasure to now uh, welcome Professor Anilo Mitra from UCL to give the vote of thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Is the microphone on? Okay. Uh, I should first thank you and congratulate you. This is like really excellent talk. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and, and just to continue the last question, I think what you witnessed today is one of the finest in all across computer graphics and computer vision. And he's, uh, Abhijit is the go-to person for anything in inverse imaging uh, uh, relating to optics. So uh, my background is in geometric modeling and geometric processing, so I look at shapes but there needs to be light so that we can see shape. So that's, that's what Abhijit does. We should also thank his family and his kids who are watching online. I think the hardest questions are waiting for Abhijit when he gets home. Uh, he'll have this question. Uh, this is a fantastic arrangement. You have polarizer, you have camera. I, I think you specially ordered these bottles so that we could see this. I think this was missing. This is my notebook, oh, but you have this fabric. Um, I, I know we have, this is the toughest part to give a talk or give an introduction before you go for the drink, so I'll keep it short. Uh, so what we saw was really a fantastic uh, mix of where we see the fundamentals in physics. We first use that for solving whatever parameters we can. And then we bring in learning our other tools for optimization. And this is especially relevant right now with so much going on in AI and generative, like 
we forget sometimes that it's not just the size of the hammer it matters, but it's our, our understanding of the fundamentals, it's, it's important. Um, I do want to stress one thing. So the first time I uh, noticed Avijit's work was his 2007 paper, um, which I recall had this, um, and the series after that, that is the spherical gradients for um, getting normals on, on human skin or human face appearance. And you see, this is uh, one of the um, world leaders who built the, the spherical gantry, did all the work um, that led to eventually the Academy Award that you talked about. Um, so scientifically, there's a lot of progress there at the level of algorithm, but also at the level of hardware to build it up. Um, and then he built it again. I don't know many people who, who had the chance or even the guts to build it twice, to build it again. But what is remarkable is we tend, as researchers often, to, to thrive on our glory and continue that. But he was the one who dismantled it and went to iPhone and iPad and, and have it down to the phone. Like this is uh, remarkable to, to do contribution at hardware level, software level, and, and to go back again to the fundamentals of the acquisition so that you, you can get it by phone. And the implications, I, I think we're at a touching, like a, a inflection point right now. What we'll see is once it's in phone, um, once someone can, if this is, uh, this, the startup goes like uh, crazy and it's acquired, et cetera, we can all acquire ourselves, right? And, and instead of, 10 data samples instead of 1,000, instead of 10,000, if you can get order of billions, then the possibilities are immense, what we can do with that. Um, and I'm only talking from the scientific point of view. There's also other aspects that we have to be very careful about. Uh, so I think this is like a, a great journey that we had the privilege to witness in, in 40 minutes. Abhijit uh, talked about 25 years of his work, and I won't count the number of hours spent in the dark rooms in the acquisition and looking for uh, hardware and software examples. But I think this is also uh, not just a celebration of what has been achieved, but what is to be achieved in, in the coming years. So please join me in congratulating Gaines for this amazing time. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Mitra for this uh, great word of thanks. Uh, it remains for me to thank you all for attending, also for the audience online. And I want to uh, draw the uh, proceedings now to a close. There will be a reception outside uh, where we can gather and speak a little bit more about these exciting topics. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That was great.